So in this final module of the course, we're going to move beyond some of the details and specifics that we've been looking at uh, up to now and, and try to broaden out uh, to look at where these ideas uh, and these concepts and these approaches uh, can take us. And so we're going to be looking at, at kind of the state of the art of, uh, of research in, uh, in music technology today. Uh, uh, what are some of the active uh, problems or domains that people are, are, are working in, uh, both in academic research and in uh, industry practice? And so each of these videos, we're going to tackle one of these kinds of uh, big areas. Uh, and we'll look at uh, some examples of what's going on in the field or what's been going on recently. Uh, and so the, the first area that I want to look at is a, a field called music information retrieval. Uh, and so in this video, we'll talk about what it is, uh, uh, some core applications uh, of it. Uh, and we'll actually work through a simple example uh, with music information retrieval using EarSketch uh, and Python and Reaper. So uh, music information retrieval, which, which is often abbreviated as uh, MIR, uh, is simply put the, the algorithmic analysis of music. Uh, so you have some kind of algorithm which takes as its input uh, either audio data or uh, some kind of symbolic or MIDI data. Um, so uh, so it, it takes in that audio data. It might be a, a recording of a song. It might be a, a, a live stream of someone uh, uh, performing. Uh, and it, it tries to learn something about it through, through analyzing that, that data. Uh, what the uh, key of it might be, what the tempo might be, where the beats are, uh, what genre it's in, uh, uh, what chords are being played, uh, what pitches are being played, all kinds of things like that. Uh, and sometimes these algorithms can run real time, like in a, a live performance situation, uh, where it's listening to a, a, a musicians who are performing. And sometimes it might be done offline uh, and out of real time, where uh, there might be a database of uh, uh, tens or, or hundreds or, or even millions of songs uh, that it's looking at and, and trying to learn about. Uh, it's a fundamentally interdisciplinary field. It, it brings together ideas uh, from digital signal processing, uh, uh, like what we looked at in, in module four, uh, but also from machine learning uh, and uh, music theory and, and psychology, particularly as it relates to uh, psychoacoustics and, and music cognition. Uh, and, uh, and so all these things kind of come together to inform the design of these algorithms uh, uh, and, and to figure out kind of how we can uh, algorithmically listen uh, uh, to audio or MIDI data and, and learn something about it the same way uh, uh, you or I might listen to it uh, and try to learn things about it as, as we're listening to it. Um, th there are a ton of different applications of, uh, of MIR algorithms. Uh, and these are just a, a few of the most uh, 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 common applications that we see today. Uh, the first one is, is, like I was saying before, to detect uh, features in the music, things like a beat, uh, you know, where the beats lie or what the tempo is. Uh, uh, what chords are being played, what key the music is in, uh, making a guess as to what genre it might be in, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the second one, and this is actually something that, that we'll talk about in, uh, in even more detail in the next video, is a, an area called machine musicianship, where you're essentially uh, using MIR to, to mimic how a, a musician might listen to other musicians, and then algorithmic composition uh, to mimic how it might respond. And, and you kind of uh, mash these two things together, MIR and algorithmic composition, and you end up with a, a, a computer program uh, that tries to simulate uh, what a musician does in, in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, a more uh, commercially important application is uh, music similarity and recommendation. Uh, and uh, uh, this has become increasingly important in, in a world where we can go uh, into the cloud and access uh, tens of millions of songs uh, anytime and on any device uh, we might have with us. Uh, when you have so many choices of what to listen to, uh, how on earth do you decide and how do you discover new things? Uh, so if we can use MIR algorithms uh, to look at the music that uh, you're already listening to and try to compare it to this giant, giant database of other stuff, we can make recommendations about other things that you might like uh, uh, through similarity metrics uh, uh, and algorithms that, 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 that help make connections between songs in these, uh, these databases. Uh, another common problem uh, that MIR can help solve is uh, is that you have a, a song stuck in your head, but you have no idea what it is. Uh, and so then you can hum it, or sing it, uh, or whistle it, or something like that. Uh, we can look at the audio of your humming uh, and do a, a query uh, to the, uh, a giant database uh, of music, uh, and again, kind of compare your humming to all these different songs in the database and find the closest match uh, to try to see uh, uh, what it was that you were actually humming and, and, and tell you what it was. Uh, and similar to that, uh, music identification software, uh, uh, like uh, popular mobile phone apps like Shazam or, or SoundHound. Uh, they can listen to uh, a, a recording that's playing uh, on the radio uh, in a restaurant, in a club, in a coffee shop, wherever you might be hearing something, or where you hear something you like and you don't know what it is, 
uh, well, you, you record a small segment of, uh, of, of that song as it's appearing in your environment. And again, you compare that uh, to a large database of music uh, to try to figure out what the best match is uh, and, and actually uh, you know, figure out what it is uh, so that you can identify it. So, so these are some uh, very popular uh, applications for music information retrieval uh, algorithms. Uh, and so what I want to focus on uh, today is as we move towards a specific example, uh, a simple example of, of MIR in practice, uh, is this notion of feature extraction, uh, looking at audio and trying to, to learn something about it. And uh, one of the most basic features that we can extract is something called a uh, spectral centroid. Uh, and we can think of this as the average frequency content of, uh, of audio. Uh, and you can imagine uh, going through the frequency domain analysis like we did at the end of module one, um, to turn our time domain waveform into uh, uh, information about the frequency content of our sound and looking at uh, 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 the, uh, the energy across all of our different frequency bands and then taking some uh, a representation of, of what the mean of that might be. Uh, and just uh, as a point of comparison, we often think of spectral centroid if we're describing it uh, colloquially as, as how bright or dark a sound is. Uh, it's not exactly about the pitch content of the sound because uh, spectral centroid might be used to analyze uh, a sound so there's a number of different pitches uh, present, like a, an entire mix down of a song or something like that. Uh, so it's this overall representation of the frequency content. Uh, and there's, there's a, a quick example of this. Uh, we have two uh, uh, frequency uh, plots here. So with each of these, we have uh, a frequency on the uh, x-axis and we have uh, decibels on the y-axis. Uh, and so you can see here, here's, a, here's an electric bass uh, that's playing back. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, very concentrated on the low frequency in there. See, that's where most of the energy lies. Um, here's a, a, a tambourine uh, that's shaking, uh, you know, ch -ch 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 -ch, like that. Uh, and this one is, is spread much more evenly across. So, so, so this, uh, this one in red here is going to have a much, more, uh, a much higher spectral centroid. It's going to sound much brighter uh, than this low bass sound is going to have. Uh, and so uh, that's the way we can kind of go through this process to figure out uh, what the spectral centroid of a sound is. Um, so uh, we have some uh, functions available inside of EarSketch uh, in the API uh, that help us uh, extract this feature from audio. Uh, and there's four uh, very closely related functions uh, that I just want to walk through quickly here. Um, the first one, uh, analyze track, uh, will simply take a, a track uh, in the DAW, uh, you give it the track number, and then you give it a constant representing the feature that you want to analyze. And it will give you the average value of that feature uh, across that entire track. Uh, the features are always returned as a, as a value between 0 and 1. Uh, and we do that so that uh, if you want to map that onto other things later, like uh, say the parameter of an effect or, or something like that, uh, it's, easy to, uh, uh, it's easy to kind of scale this because you always know that it falls in the 0 to 1 range. Um, the, the next one is a, a closely related one, analyze track for time. So we're still analyzing a track, a specific feature. Uh, but uh, instead of on the entire track, we're doing it uh, the average value of that feature uh, between starting time and an ending time, uh, specifying time like we always do uh, in EarSketch as a floating point number. Um, and then these next two are the comparable things, but instead of analyzing on a track, you give it a, a sound constant. Uh, and it will analyze, uh, in the case of the analyze uh, function here, it will do the entire sound and, and give the average value of the feature across the entire sound. Uh, and analyze for time will give you the average uh, value of that feature uh, between a starting time and an ending time. Now, these are all the features that are supported. Uh, you can see spectral centroid is the first one on the list there. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail uh, uh, about how all of these work, uh, uh, but there is some supplementary documentation that explains all these features uh, in a little bit more detail. So now that we can extract these features, uh, what do we actually want to do with them? Uh, there's a ton of different things we could do with them. Uh, I want to work through a very simple example here. Uh, with an idea uh, it actually comes from medieval music uh, where uh, singers might rapidly uh, kind of trade notes on a melody back and forth and back and forth and back and forth um, called hocketing. Uh, and so I want to do something like that uh, to, to kind of merge two drum beats together. Uh, so what I'm going to do in this script is uh, I'm going to look uh, uh, at every 16th note. I'm going to look at uh, uh, which, of, uh, which of two tracks has a, uh, a higher spectral centroid value uh, for that chunk of time. And, uh, and the one that has a higher value, I'm going to keep. And the, the one that has a lower value, I'm just going to decrease its volume uh, using a volume effect uh, uh, so that it's silent. So at, at any given time, only track one or track two is sounding. And they're trading back and forth very rapidly, uh, depending on which has the highest uh, spectral centroid uh, value at any given time. 
So since the font size of that script uh, on the slide was a little small because it was a, a fairly long script, uh, I want to open it here directly in EarSketch so that we can uh, uh, look at it and walk through the code here. Um, so uh, I'm just going to go through this line by line and explain exactly what's happening. So uh, we start by, uh, of course, importing the EarSketch API, uh, uh, initializing a new project and setting its tempo. Um, and then I pick two sounds. These are the two sounds I want to use on, on my two tracks to create this kind of merged drum beat. So I just have two different drum beats from uh, Richard Devine's uh, uh, electro collection. Um, and then I, I define my analysis method, which is a, a constant here as well, spectral centroid. Um, so um, that's how I want to actually analyze these. So I, I'm just setting up some basic variables here for my sounds, my analysis method. And then the next thing I set up is a hop size. So I want to move through uh, this, uh, this file by analyzing uh, chunks of, uh, of audio that are a 16th note long each. Um, so I arrived at this, this hop size by basically just taking one you know, for uh, the length of a measure and dividing it by 16. And that gives me this number here, 0.0625. Um, and then uh, my segment starts at measure one and it ends at measure three. Um, so over the course of those two measures, I'm gonna end up with 32 little chunks of audio I wanna analyze, because going by 16th note, there's 16, 16th notes in each measure, there's two measures. Um, so you know, 16 times two gives me 32 chunks. Um, so that's all my kind of basic setup work. Uh, and now I can go uh, on and uh, uh, just use Fit Media to put the audio onto the two tracks. So that, again, is, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and then here comes the heart of what I'm trying to do here, um, to actually do the analysis. So I have a for loop here where I'm walking through each chunk of audio, each of these 32 chunks. It's a 16th note long. Um, I'm setting my loop index just I, so I know which chunk I'm on. I need to figure out where, where does the chunk start? What is its starting position? Um, so it's going to be 1 plus I times hop. So let me explain a little bit more how that works. So when i is 0, that's just going to be 1 plus 0 um, times 0 0.0625, so that's 0. Um, then um, when, it's, uh, um, when it's 1, it's going to be 1 plus 0 0.0625, so 1 16th note after measure 1. Um, when it's 2, it's going to be 1 plus 2 times my hop. So two sixteenth notes in. And then when i is 3, it's going to be 1 plus 3 times my hop. So three sixteenth notes in, and so forth. So each time, I'm moving my starting point forward by 1 16th note. And of course, at the beginning, I start at 1. That's why we start with the 1 plus, because I count measures uh, beginning at 1 uh, in ear sketch. So that's my position. And then I compute my feature values by using this ear sketch API method called analyze track for time. And so first I tell it what the track is going to be. So the first time I'm doing it on track one, the second time I'm doing it on track two. What is my analysis method? Spectral centroid. Um, where do I start an analyzing? That's my starting position, my position variable. And where do I end analyzing? Well, that's going to be 1 16th note later, so position plus hop, since hop represents a 16th note. Um, so now I've got my spectral centroid on track one, and I've got my spectral centroid on track two. Now I want to figure out what to do. So if feature 1 is greater than feature 2, so this is a conditional that's basically telling me I want to see if this statement is true. And if it is, then I want to execute this code. If it's not true, then I want to execute whatever is under my else code. Um, so if feature 1 is greater than feature 2, in other words, if the spectral centroid value for this little chunk is bigger in track 1 than in track 2, well, then I call this first collection of set effect commands. So I basically set my volume gain to 0 on track one, and zero just means don't change my volume at all, keep it at its original value. And on track two, I'm setting it to minus 60. So that's saying, well, make it silent by decreasing it by negative 60 decibels. Um, so that's what happens if spectral centroid is bigger on track one. I want to keep track one. I want to silence track two um, for that chunk. Otherwise, if that's not the case, well, then I want to do the opposite. I want to silence track one by setting its gain to minus 60 dB, and I want to keep track 2 at its original volume by setting its gain to 0. And that's the end of the script. We just call finish, and we're good. Um, so I can go ahead and hit run script now, and I can hear it. Uh, so here's the result of running that script. And you can see that my uh, volume automations are constantly going up and down and up and down every 16th note or two or three 16th notes. And whenever this one is up, this one is down at silence. And whenever this one is up, 
this one is down sign. So they're mirror images of each other, so that only one sound is playing at any given time. And the sound that's playing is the one that has the higher spectral centroid, that's the brighter sound. Um, so let's go ahead and listen to this kind of composite hocketed drum beat. And if I want, I can solo just the first track. So you can hear the parts of it that were deemed to be brighter that are included. And I can hear the brighter parts of the second track, the parts of that that are included. Um, and if you want, I can in fact bypass this so you can hear the entire original sound file, the parts that were included and the parts that were not. And now let's go back to that composite again, where I hear everything together. So it sounds kind of like a self-contained drum beat. It's taken the brighter elements of both of those individual drum beats and retained them and rejected the darker elements. So we end up with a, a drum beat that's kind of brighter than either of them would have been on its own. Um, now, what if we wanted to do the, the opposite? Um, how would we make a darker version? Um, that retains the darker parts of both of these. So if we want to create a darker drum beat, it's the darker versions of each of these, all I have to do is instead of uh, making this comparison be if feature one is greater than feature two, um, I can just say if it's less. So now if the spectral centroid is less on track one than track two, I keep track one and I mute track two. Um, so I've essentially just done the opposite of what I did before. So I can go ahead and hit run script and hear how this sounds. And this is the result that we get uh, when we change the greater than sign to a less than sign, and we uh, get the lower spectral centroids uh, retained and the higher spectral centroids muted. So to review what we've covered uh, in this module, uh, we looked at music information retrieval and some key application areas. Uh, we've talked about feature extraction, uh, and particularly about uh, spectral centroid as an important uh, base feature. Uh, and then uh, we've looked at a, a kind of creative application of using uh, MIR in the context of, uh, of EarSketch and Python and Reaper uh, through this kind of hocketing uh, that's going back and forth between two tracks based on uh, the spectral centroid value. Uh, in the next video, we're going to turn uh, in more detail to one specific application area of MIR, uh, machine musicianship.